I have found the lectionary this year to be an incredible blessing. It just never stops giving to us. I, I joke quite often that you would think that the lectionary committee sat and thought all those years ago, what exactly are they gonna need in 2020 when that pandemic hits and when the nation divides in two and when nationalism sweeps the globe and when there's all that trouble with uh, racial killings, what are they gonna need in terms of readings? And that's what we have had this year. And it keeps ringing straight on through into Advent, these passages that speak directly into where we are. It's wonderful to start a new year, to start a new gospel, and these very first words at the beginning of Matthew speak to us today as well as they spoke when they were said the first time to that first Christian community. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. It starts with the prophecy, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah. We begin to, we begin with Advent, we begin with the, the start of the uh, liturgical year. We begin with what we hope is a turning of the corner in pandemic with vaccines on the horizon, even though we know we've got an incredibly rough patch in front of us for the next six to eight, 10 weeks, somewhere in there, but we know those vaccines are on the way. So we're, we're it feels like we're at the beginning of either the middle to the end or the uh, to seeing some light at the end of the tunnel. We're at the beginning of the transfer of power in our um, country, something that we rely upon every time a new president is elected. And my friends, Christians sitting here in this church this morning, we are at the beginning of our prophecy in these times that every single one of us sitting here today, every single one of us hearing these words today are at the beginning of our ability to be prophets in this time. Every single one of us is called to speak into the fact that there is actually plenty of food in our world, that there is actually plenty of good education, that there is actually plenty of housing, plenty of work, plenty of medical care, that there is plenty of faith to go around from everyone. Each of us has the ability to be that prophet that speaks that message into a world that is so dominated by fear right now and so dominated by scarcity that we could actually plow crops under, which we routinely do in our country, we could plow crops under and believe with all of our hearts and souls that there's not enough food to go around. Oh, my friends. Do we have a calling? Do we have a calling to be prophets? And this is simply the beginning of that time. It makes sense that it's the beginning of the time because when people are called to be prophets, so often they are coming out of trouble. And look at us, we are coming out of trouble. If there's anything that will be said about 2020 in years to come, it will be the year of the troubles. The troubles felt not just here, but the troubles felt around the globe. The troubles that weren't just about pandemic, but the troubles that pandemic seemed to illuminate. The troubles seemed to expand. The, the, the pandemic seemed to make us see it, see what we had not seen before, and in some cases seemed to make it grow. 2020 has been the year of incredibly deep trouble. And you know, it's, as we head to the end of the year, do, do you hear more and more people saying, it can't be over fast enough? I'll be so glad when this year is done so we can move into the next year. Because you know, January 1st, 2021, it's all gonna immediately be different. Somehow, I think not. We have been in deep trouble and it's going to take time to come out of that. And we watch prophets get called. Prophets get called when, when the nation, when people, when God's people have been in deep trouble, prophets get called to speak to that group of people about the thing that God sees, the thing that God knows, the thing that God wants, or to speak in general about God's love for people. Prophets are called by God to speak into the hopelessness 
of God's people, to speak into the worry of God's people, to speak into the sinfulness of God's people, to, to speak sometimes to God's people's backs as they have walked away from whatever it is God had for them. Prophets are called to speak directly into those things by God. And it's multiple prophets. Some prophets we know the names of. So today's passage that we get from Mark immediately refers back to the prophet Isaiah. And we heard that passage from Isaiah first before we listened to Mark. And that piece of Isaiah begins what we call the second Isaiah, the second part of Isaiah that is written at a different time in exile for the nation of Israel and is a completely different prophet than the prophet we hear in, in chapters 1 through 39 of Isaiah. And if we actually look at chapters 1 through 39 of Isaiah, it's multiple prophets that are speaking there. We, whenever we say Isaiah, we say it as if we're talking about one person, but what we're really talking about is a number of prophets we actually actually don't know how many prophets. Could have been scores of prophets. Could have been two or three. Could have been a family of prophets traditioning things down to each other. It's difficult for us to know, but the thing that we know for certain from reading their writings and the differences in their writings is it's different writers that are writing those prophecies. And it's different stories that they are speaking into. So this this first very beginning of, of Mark's uh, gospel that speaks directly to the beginning of Jesus' uh, ministry by referring immediately to the prophet also puts us in a completely pla a different place as Christians. We, rec we recognize not only the prophet's voice, but we also recognize that the prophecy is for us too. It's not just that the prophecy is about John the Baptist coming in to baptize all those people, but the prophecy is about all those who will follow and that their voices might be a voice in the wilderness calling for someone to bring comfort for someone to bring peace, for someone to make a way for God's love to come through. Prepare the way because the Messiah is coming. Prepare the way because Jesus will be here. Prepare the way that that prophecy continues on through generations, prophet after prophet all talking about how to prepare for Jesus to come. Not just one prophet and not just many prophets way back then, but all of the prophets from the people who gathered right there in that river to be baptized by John, from John being prophet saying, listen, I'm gonna do this for you. I'm gonna baptize you. You turn to God and I'm gonna baptize you. Your sins are forgiven. I'm gonna baptize you and you're gonna be in new water, but somebody greater than me is coming. And he's not gonna be bound up in water. He's gonna baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, how in the world could John have known that every single one of you who were baptized was going to have someone lay your, their hands on you, make the sign of the cross of your forehead and oil that had been blessed by a bishop somewhere, spread out amongst all the congregations, asking for the Holy Spirit to bless that oil, that someone was going to take that very oil, make the sign of the cross on your forehead when you were baptized as an infant, as a child, as a young adult, as an older adult, whenever you were baptized, someone would seal you in the Holy Spirit and make you Christ's own forever. It wasn't just about the water. The water's important. But when John prophesied, he prophesied about Jesus and he was prophesying about us too. That we would be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I think it's helpful to remember how this story ends. Uh, 
a little confession about how I am. I'm a chicken. I don't like scary movies. I don't like scary books. I don't like suspense. I have enough to deal with in my life that if I'm going to read something, I want to know what the end is. I don't want to be worried about it. So I read the end of every book before I finish the first chapter. That's how I know I want to keep going. The Bible is a great place to do the exact same thing. So we start off with Mark and, you know, Mark moves very quickly. He's like the wind coming straight through. We're not talking about lambs. We're not talking about shepherds. There's no uh, people, wise people looking for the star in the east. There's no angel singing. We go straight into it with, with John the Baptist. We go straight into it with the prophet speaking. So you would think that somebody that comes across that firm, that comes across with that kind of gusto, I got to say, Mark is my kind of evangelist because he's the kind that says snap out of it. It's not very helpful today if you just say snap out of it when you're trying to evangelize. People kind of shut down. <laughs> so, But he's my kind of evangelist. He just gets right to the point. Say what you got to say and move on. That, I like that kind of person. So it, it's, it's interesting when you see that fast start, you think, wow, everybody must have just picked up and believed and they must have all been really great prophets. Well, think about your reading of Mark. How many great prophets do you read about in Mark? Um, there would be none. <laughs> when you don't read about any great prophets in Mark, you got to read to the end of the book. When you get to the last chapter of Mark, and of course, the last chapter of all the Gospels, we know what happens. Jesus goes to the cross, dies, is, is risen, and they, they see the resurrected Jesus at some point. Except Mark's book ends a little bit differently. After his death on the cross, and he's been removed to the tomb, when the Sabbath is over, Mary Magdalene, the mother of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Salome, those three women go to the tomb, and they look for him, because they want to anoint his body, they want to take care of him. When they get into the tomb, stone's been rolled away, same shock that everybody has had who rolled away the stone. They walk in, there's a young man sitting there, all dressed in white. He has a glow about him. They get afraid. I would too, because I wouldn't have read, known the end of the story if I were them. I'd have been afraid and I would have been running in the other direction. <laughs> That's what I do when I see things that don't make sense to me. I get out of there. I don't keep going. But they stayed there. He said, he's not here. He's not here and you won't find him here. He is risen. You need to go back and tell the disciples and tell them you will see him in Galilee. They run back and they tell everyone. And the, the, the chapter ends in Mark with this words. Overcome with terror and dread, they fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. All that prophecy, all that time in ministry with Jesus, and in the very end, the bravest three, these women who were brave enough to go to the tomb, got so afraid they just ran home and they didn't tell anybody about it. That gives us all some hope. Because I think it's entirely possible. The reason that we don't step into our role as prophets right now is because we get afraid. We may not see an, an angelic presence or a, a special messenger from God sitting in a room telling us that there's something we should say or something that we should do. But oh boy, do we get that feeling. You know that feeling I'm talking about where you just, something in your stomach does not feel settled or it's hard to sleep and you just have restless sleep. You keep waking up. The worry just stays at the back of your head. You kind of hope, oh, please don't let me run into that group of people. Let me see if I can avoid being in conversation with them. I just don't want to get into it. Let me see if I can walk past whatever that is. 
I, I spent some time talking with a New York City homicide detective and he would say all of those feelings are our gut responses. And he firmly believed that what happened in our, in our guts, what happens in our gut when we get that restlessness or we're not sure if we should do something or we get nervous, something doesn't feel right. We know we should say something. We don't wanna say something. It makes us break out in a cold sweat. He's like, what's happening in your gut is the Holy Spirit's talking to you. That was his experience dealing with victims of crime. He said every time he talked to a victim of crime, they could all point to a moment when they felt like they had a warning, go in a different direction or don't go around the corner or call somebody. And they went ahead anyway, they ignored that. And he goes, every time you ignore that, you're ignoring the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, you forget, we hear baptized in the spirit and all of us immediately go, well, you know, in Pentecostal churches, they do that. And when they baptize you in the spirit, you go flying across the room. I have been in Pentecostal churches. I have watched that happen. I am not Pentecostal. I'm Episcopalian. When I put my hands on some child's head or some adult's head and I make the sign of the cross in oil, I expect the Holy Spirit to take up residence in that person, whether they fly across the room or not, because that's how she works. The Holy Spirit comes to us and takes up residence in us and will speak to us in dreams, will speak to us in upset stomachs, will speak to us in that tingling feeling that goes down our back sometimes, will speak to us when we know the, we should put on the brakes, that we should just stop speaking, or we should start speaking. The Spirit speaks to us, and that's our moment. That is our moment to be prophetic. I think what has hindered us somewhat in, in our country has been we've gotten so reliant on uh, particular prophetic voices, especially in our country. If, if you say prophetic, you ought to automatically what comes up. How many of you thought Martin Luther King, King Jr.? That, when we say prophet in the U.S., that's immediately what comes up. I would say to you, in as Episcopalians in 2020, one of the voices that should come up for us immediately is our presiding bishop. He has been speaking consistently about a way of love at a time when people are talking about hatred and division as if we are supposed to feed on hatred and division. Over and over and over again, he keeps bringing us back to this way of love and not a way of love that means we don't do any hard work. He brings us to a way of love and says, and do the hard work. Because when you love somebody, you can't help but want to do hard work for them. You can't help but want to speak up. You know, some of our, um, I, I think most uh, uninhibited prophets are probably under the age of 10. They can tell you in a heartbeat what's unfair. They can tell you in a New York minute who you need to speak up for. They have no doubt about what is right and what is wrong. And they will be loud about it. Our young people that we've been seeing in protests across this country that continue because the protests aren't in the news, don't think they're not continuing. It's just that they're not news at the moment. Our young people who have been protesting racial killings, racial injustice, racial hatred. That is a prophetic voice that we are hearing. When our presiding bishop says, let's see what we need to do to become beloved community, to become that place 
where everybody knows they are created by God and everyone is treated with dignity and with love and there is justice for all. Let's focus ourselves on beloved community. When the Episcopal Church makes a statement like that and then creates the materials and the support structure for us as dioceses and as congregations to spend time figuring out what that means to be beloved community. That's the Episcopal Church speaking with a prophetic voice. When every single one of us makes the decision to do the work that the Holy Spirit gives us to do, to stay in those uncomfortable places, to read the books that make us feel uncomfortable, to have the difficult conversations, to talk with people who are not like us, who do not think how we think, who may have absolutely no experience of oppression. When we make the effort to stand in the shoes of one who lives with oppression every single day, we are stepping into our prophetic voice. It takes effort to listen to the Holy Spirit. You've got to develop a habit of doing that. For most of us, that means devoting prayer time. It seriously means devoting prayer time. That on a regular basis, whether that is morning, noon, or night, on a regular basis, you say your prayers, you read your Bible, you do all the things, you tell God all the things you need to tell God. I feel for God sometimes because when I get talking, I got a lot to say to God. My list is long of the things that I need God to address immediately. And when I'm done, when all of us are done, telling God all the things we need God to know, then we need to close our mouths for a minute and open our ears and open our minds and listen to that movement of the spirit. Might happen in our gut, might happen in our thoughts, might be a piece of music that we remember, might be a word of scripture. It might be the sense that there's someone we need to call, something that we need to read, somebody that we need to write to. But it takes developing that practice of listening for the Spirit's voice and, and as important, acting on it when we hear it. Because if we're constantly turning the sound down on the Spirit's voice, then we lose the ability to recognize the sound. It's not that she left. It's not that she's not speaking to us. It's just that we've gotten so good at turning, tuning down, turning, tuning out the sound of the spirit's voice that we don't hear her call to us. Every prophet, every prophet hears that message that comes directly from God through God's vision, through God's spirit, through God's knowledge. Every prophet has that. If there was a present I could give you this Advent, I would tell you, keep coming back to those opening words of Mark. Keep coming back to the, that first passage in 2nd Isaiah, Isaiah 40, 1 through 11 that we read this morning. Did we go to 11 or 9? I can't remember. That first passage in Isaiah. Keep coming back to those things. They will help you remember who you are. We live in a complicated time, but friends, we've been through incredible complications. We've been through an incredibly rough time. So the complications that we have in front of us are not anything 
that we don't know how to withstand. Look what we've just withstood for the last nine months. We're walking towards the light now. We're walking towards great change now. And every single voice of every single Christian, and certainly every Episcopalian in Northern New Jersey, every single voice of the prophet is needed. So nurture your inner prophet. Read the passages. Develop a practice of listening to the voice of the Spirit. And then act on what the Spirit says to you. And if you've got a prayer group or a spiritual friend, talk with them about it so it doesn't just get lost in your head. But it becomes part of the story. Here's the thing. This is what gives me hope about that group of scared women at the end of Mark. You know, the church lets us know, and we can go backwards. If you read your, if you go to your Bible tonight and look at the end of Mark, you will see that part that I just read to you ends at verse eight. And then there's a note about a whole other section, verse nine through 15 or 16. It's um, a, an addition to Mark. It's an additional ending that pretties it up and tells us how the disciples then went on. The, the note has been there since the third century. The scholars right away knew that this was the community trying to make it better. This was not the gospel writer. This was the community trying to make it better. We don't have to paper over and make it better. I can show you what makes it better. Read Acts of the Apostles. The story doesn't end with them being afraid. It doesn't end with us being afraid. It's okay to be afraid. Just read to the end of the book. You'll know what comes next. Amen.